I want to bring in my colleague in the White House, NBC's chief White House correspondent, Kristen Welker. David Farenholt covers Trump and his businesses for The Washington Post. He's the one who broke this story. Renato Mariotta is a former federal prosecutor, a legal affairs columnist for Politico as well. And Joyce Vance, our friend, is a former U.S. attorney and professor at the University of Alabama School of Law. David, let me start with you because it's your reporting here. It wasn't un unexpected, but it's certainly significant. Talk to us about what exactly this means, this impaneling of a special grand jury. Well, it means, as you said earlier, that the DA is shifting the focus of investigation from, from gathering evidence, vacuuming up evidence about Donald Trump, to now trying to marshal that evidence, to put it together and make a case that one person or a set of persons committed a crime. So this, it's not going to be a quick process, and we don't know how it's going to turn out, but that's the next step. Over the next six months, the DA's folks are going to go into this grand jury and show them evidence, probably a lot more evidence than a jury in a real trial would see, and then ask them to vote on whether they find probable cause that somebody, or maybe more than one somebody, committed a crime. And Kristen, obviously, we've heard a lot from the former president, not as much since he left office, of course, but he has lashed out at federal prosecutors on numerous occasions, very rarely, if ever, and certainly not lately, going after the substance of the accusations against him. What is he saying right now? That's right, Peter. We are hearing from former President Trump what we've heard from him so many times before when he has been under investigation, never been charged with anything. But he is dismissing this as a continuation of the greatest witch hunt in American history. He's also trying to argue that this is purely politics. Let me read you a part of his defiant statement that he released overnight. He says this is purely political and an affront to the almost 75 million voters who supported me in the presidential election and is being driven by highly partisan Democrat prosecutors. Peter, that last part of the sentence is important because I am told in conversations with those who are close to the former president that that is going to be exhibit A. He's trying to cast the prosecutors as politically driven should this situation and should this investigation escalate. But taking a step back, this is a growing political problem for the former president. He wants to re-engage. We know that he's going to be out on the trail campaigning for candidates in the midterms. And so this undoubtedly will cast a shadow not only over the former president, but over the GOP as well as they try to navigate how to move forward in the post-Trump era. So there is a lot of concern within the Republican Party about this latest legal development within Trump world, Peter. And Joyce, let me ask you if I can right now, the impaneling of a special grand jury doesn't mean that any particular person will be charged. It doesn't mean that the former president himself will be charged. But we certainly know that there is a lot that they've been focused on in terms of the scope of this investigation in and around Mr. Trump's world. Here's what we heard from his former fixer, his fir former attorney, Michael Cohen, just a couple years ago. Take a listen. To your knowledge, did the president or his company ever inflate assets or revenues? Yes. And uh, was that done with the president's knowledge or direction? Everything was done with the knowledge and at the direction of Mr. Trump. Do you think we need to review his financial statements and his tax returns in order to compare them? Yes, and you'd find it at the Trump org. So, Joyce, obviously, with this investigation stemming in large part from that testimony as it relates to tax and, and financial bank type fraud, what, what do we know specifically about the scope of this investigation? Well, I think you're right, Peter. That testimony from Michael Cohen was likely the origin story for this investigation. And that implies that prosecutors have been looking at both the possibility of tax fraud and bank fraud. Perhaps they're looking at compensation schemes for executives of the Trump organization. But, you know, something that's important to remember is that Cy Vance has used his grand jury very effectively in the, in the past. In late February, after a hard-fought battle, he finally got access to Trump Organization's taxes and to, to the underlying documentation for those tax returns. He's now had several months to scrutinize those materials. He has reportedly brought in some forensic accounting experts. And so convening a special grand jury that can focus three days a week on, on matters relating to the Trump Organization and perhaps individual defendants would seem to signify that he's hit pay dirt someplace in here. You don't bring a special grand jury in just not for nothing to waste everyone's time. 
This is now a more focused investigation, but we don't yet know what its goal is. So, Renato, how tough is it to prove tax fraud here? Here's something that you tweeted that I found interesting. You wrote specifically, fraud is just when you lie to people to get their money. So the case usually comes down to whether the defendant knew the statements in the documents were false. You say it's easier to prove knowledge for people involved in preparing or authorizing the documents like Weisselberg. Obviously, they're referencing to the chief financial officer for the Trump organization. So state of mind ultimately at the end of the day would come into play here. Absolutely. That's what a fraud case usually comes down to. So uh, ultimately, look, there's false statements in all sorts of documents. Sometimes we make mistakes, things like that. But what turns a, a false statement in a document into a fraud case is having the knowledge that the, the statement's false and intending to defraud people. And so that could be tricky. We don't have a uh, telescope that sees inside people's mind. And so typically the sort of evidence that's required to prove the knowledge of the falsehood and the intent to defraud is is either going to be like some really salty email or text message, you know, saying, yeah, right. let's the numbers or testimony from somebody who's going to say, yes, Donald Trump and I discussed uh, this tax return and he told me to inflate the numbers and something like that. Obviously, it's hypothetical, but that's the sort of hypothetical evidence you would And David, a lot of Americans right now are trying to make sense of all of what we've been reading about the former president and these investigations. You've got the Manhattan District Attorney. You've got the New York Attorney General, Letitia James, as well. She's sharing some of her lawyers with the Manhattan DA right now. Can you help us understand the state of play? Sure, it is complicated. There are two separate investigations going. The New York Attorney General is running what had been a civil investigation, basically an investigation that would end with a lawsuit. Uh, And and she has told us a little bit about what she's interested in. She's interested in five or six different transactions where Trump uh, allegedly misstated his assets, either to to lower his taxes or to get uh, a loan from a lender, to convince a lender he was a better credit risk. Um, She hasn't told us all the evidence that she has, but she said those are the things she's focused on. More recently, she said that she's developed some kind of criminal evidence, and that dovetails with this Cy Vance criminal inquiry, whose scope is really much larger. Basically, it's all of Trump's finances going back to 2011. We don't really know what he seized on. And Joyce, let me ask you about Cy Vance, the Manhattan Manhattan DA. Obviously, his term expires at the end of this year. What do you make of that in terms of the time frame that we're playing with here for the possibility of charges? You know, I know a lot of folks have speculated that Cy Vance would want to see this case come to fruition before he leaves office. I think prosecutors are like everybody else. We like to see our our work um, be productive. Likely the timing of this special grand jury, which will terminate in November, would indicate that there is some hope that indictments or a decision not to indict could be reached by then. But of course, this special grand jury can be extended for an additional period of time. There are absolutely no guarantees here that this work is finished in November. And Renato, back to where we started about this special grand jury. They can help obtain records. They can help follow through um, with the returning of indictments. They can also try to lock in testimony, can't they? Is it likely or very possible that this grand jury would be used to try to lock in the testimony of some of those who may be key to the investigation itself? Yeah, absolutely. Anyone who lived through the Mueller investigation remembers uh, reports of witnesses coming in and out of that grand jury. They had of similar uh, things happening here. And as you point out, this is about locking in testimony. In other words, as opposed to just saying, having a conversation with someone, now they'll have to raise their right hand, take an oath, and testify under oath to a bunch of grand jurors, ordinary citizens. So I think we will start seeing those reports in the weeks ahead. 